Who am I? That's a simple enough question. Yet it's called life's most defining question. And I think that's accurate. Because our identity is how we define ourselves. And that defines how we think, how we feel, and how we act. So it's a simple question, right? Not so fast. These days we're told that who am I is the wrong question to ask. Such as in an article in Psychology Today. Who am I? This question, asked so often, suggests that there is actually a possible answer. Almost as if our being were a fixed thing. A far better question to ask yourself, how would I like to experience my life? So we're being told by our world that life's most defining question is unanswerable. And we shouldn't even be trying to answer it. Is it any reason why so many people in our world are suffering from an identity crisis? Add to this the novel idea that one of the simplest components of identity, one's sexuality or gender, is now a complex, ever-changing realm. Transgenderism is now a thing, a non-definable concept that seeks to define a generation. A study published last year estimates nearly 1.6 million people over the age of 13 in the United States identify themselves as transgender. For adults, it comes out to 0.5%, five out of 1,000. For young people age 13 to 17, it's 1.4%, almost three times the rate of adults. They claim that they have a different gender identity than the sex they were assigned at birth. What's the answer? As Christians, what do we have to say about this? And to be honest, most of us are saying nothing. Most of us are afraid to say anything on the subject because of how our cancel culture will shut us down. I remarked this last week to Tammy, I wouldn't be surprised if our YouTube channel gets shut down after I post this message. That's the way our culture is. If you don't agree with them, they'll cancel you out. Some of us don't know what to say. Maybe some of us aren't sure we even have a handle on the concept to be able to talk about it. And so we don't. I don't think that's the stance we should take. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And we have the truth for every matter of life and practice. We can't afford to stay silent But we also can't afford to speak the wrong things or in the wrong manner. We've got to be careful. We've got to be knowledgeable. We have to be sensitive. We need to, in the words of Scripture, speak the truth in love. And too often we do one or the other or neither. We can speak the truth and beat people over the head with it. We can claim to love someone, and so we don't want to tell them anything that might hurt their feelings. Or we don't say anything at all and let people drive off a cliff. I think there's a better alternative. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, in preparing this message, usually my sermons are six pages typed. This one was eight. Now, if I had known there had been a 15-minute penalty at the beginning of the message, I'd have just included it. (laughs) But I did edit it down. What you're going to hear this morning is the edited version. If you go online to our website and download the print version, you'll get the whole thing. 
Last week, we began considering identifying my identity. And we began by examining who I am by creation. We saw that every person who has ever been conceived is created by Almighty God in His image and likeness. We possess a body, a soul, and a spirit. The soul is comprised of the mind by which we think, the heart by which we feel, and a will by which we choose. That is true of every human being that's ever been conceived. Male, female, equally created in the image of God. Not identical, but equally valuable. But identity issues aren't that simple. We spent a lot of time last week in the first two chapters of Genesis. We saw how God formed mankind of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And humanity became a living species. Everything that was created in those first two chapters are described as very good God created them in perfection. And then we get to Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3, the wheels come off. In Genesis 3, we are introduced to the concept of sin. Adam and Eve, the prototype humans, chose to go their own way instead of God's way, which is a pretty decent definition of sin. And sin corrupted everything, especially human beings. So if we want to understand who I am, if I want to understand my identity, I need to see who I am, not only by creation, but also by corruption. And that's our message this morning. I begin with the damaging spread of sin. Genesis 3 not only records the first committal of sin, but also the consequences of that first sin. And in the interest of time this morning, I'm not going to read through Genesis 3. I would suggest to you, if you have a chance, to read through that, and you'll see how damaging sin is and how it is spread. It's like a wildfire that is destroying everything in its path. Instead, I'd like to go to the book of Romans this morning. Romans chapter 5, to start with. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, please understand Paul in this passage is making a contrast between the impact of Adam's sin and the intervention of Christ's sacrifice. So there's a lot of just as this, then that. What I want to focus this morning and what I'm going to pull out of these verses is only the impact of Adam's sin. Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. Many died by the trespass of the one man. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. By the trespass of the one man, death reigned through the one man. The result of one trespass was condemnation for all men. Through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. This is the damaging spread of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, there was corruption that came into their bodies, their minds, their souls, and that was passed on to every human being who's ever been born with the exception of Jesus Christ, because he was born supernaturally. Every other human being has been born with this corruption. We all stand guilty of sin because we inherit Adam's sin nature. And if we want to use the terminology common today, ever since Adam made his choice to disobey God, he and all of his descendants have been identified with sin. That's part of our identity. His declaration of independence from God 
explains the rebellious nature we each inherited. And trust me, it's something we're born with. It's not television shows, it's not violent video games, it's not education, it's not our environment. We are born with it. And it's something we all deal with. Because we were born into the family of Adam, we possess the natural bent to live self-centered lives, which is another good definition of sin. To be an Adam means that you are an heir to everything he was. And so my identity, who I am by creation, has been fundamentally corrupted by sin. And the damaging spread of sin has corrupted even our sense of identity. How we see ourselves, how we see one another, has been clouded, corrupted by sin. Well, now I'd like to move back in the book of Romans to chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we see the downward spiral of sin. You see, sin doesn't just exist on a flat level. It spirals downward. It gets worse and worse. And in this passage, Paul very graphically describes that downward spiral, beginning in verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodlessness, all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Hang on to that thought. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Here's the corruption. Mind and heart. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but approve of those who practice them. That's heavy. That's something that you won't hear in a lot of pulpits today. In fact, some years ago, there was a pastor in Sweden who simply read that passage from the book of Romans and was put in jail for it. They called it a hate crime. Hold on, because it's not going to be too long. It's going to be the same here. That's where we're headed. But did you see the downward spiral of sin? 
When you reject God, you reject the truth. And when you reject the truth, you'll fall for anything. You will believe the lie. And we're going to see some very specific lies that have come out of this whole rejection of the truth. But it isn't just a mental thing. It's not just what we think. It affects what we do. And in this downward spiral of sin, you see an ever-increasingly amount of immorality, degradation. Now, sin is not confined to sexual deviation from God's intent, but Paul does highlight sexual sin in this passage. And given our present identity issues, how so much of it revolves around sexuality, I think this text is particularly relevant. In many ways, these days, sex is much more than it used to be. Sexual desire is now considered central to one's identity. Sexual self-expression is seen by many to be essential for a healthy personhood. It's been elevated to something that God never intended it to be, a way to identify ourselves. And yet at the same time, sex is much less than it used to be. Sexual acts are considered morally neutral. There's no resulting honor or shame. And sex is used for all kinds of trivial purposes. I mean, we use sex to sell things, to gain attention, to build superstardom, to become popular, to write song lyrics. It's been reduced from what God had intended to that. So how do we arrive at a balanced biblical view? We go back to the truth. Now understand that behind the surface polarization we're seeing in this whole gender issue lie two very different understandings of what gender is and how it's determined. The older understanding, which is called biological essentialism, says that a person's gender is determined by the objective fact of their biological sex. This understands that sex and gender are the same thing. And how you were born biologically determines your gender. It's a fact. Where there's a felt mismatch, that subjectivity should yield to the objective facts that are there. Now, on the other hand, this newer understanding called psychological essentialism claims that the objective facts of biology do not determine a person's gender. They separate the term sex and gender as meaning different things, but rather by their gender identity, their own subjective sense of who they are, that's what determines their gender. In other words, we make it up as we go along. In light of this divide, the social, medical, political, legislative changes being wrought by these widespread acceptance of transgender claims, we as Christians have an urgent need to search the scriptures carefully, to prayerfully see how God would have us think and how to respond to these revolutionary developments. Now, last week we saw that when God created The human race, he created male and female, and there aren't any other options. There is no sex spectrum. You can't be one, the other, both, neither. There's only two options when it comes to sexuality, male and female. Both are identified as being created in the image and likeness of God. So while they're not identical, they are equal. But there's only two. Now this isn't only scripture that says this, it's also science that says it. And I got to admit, I always chuckle when I hear these people say, it's the science. It's the science. Yeah, it's the science until the science doesn't agree and then they can ignore that. Because this whole issue of gender uh, fluency and the gender identity chucks biology right out the window. It takes all of the years of biological study and science 
and throws it away. So this isn't just scripture speaking, this is also science speaking. You say, how can that be? How can they so conveniently throw away the facts that have always been accepted? Here's how. Paul described it. Their thinking became futile, their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's how. That's how. And I want to point out three specific lies that are coming out of this movement that are being pawned off as facts, and they are not. The first one I've already touched on, this idea that human sexuality lies in a spectrum between male and female and that individuals can choose between or none of the above. That's a lie. There's only two, and you're born with it. Another lie is that gender is a social construct. And what does that mean? Gender, we're told, is not a fixed trait rooted in biology. Instead, it's a social construct that culture creates. And they say that some identify with the sexuality that they were assigned at birth. Who assigns sexuality? God does, that's who. Because he created you that way. But somebody doesn't just say, well, is this going to be a boy or a girl? We'll flip a coin. Where does it come from? But they will call these individuals cisgender. If you ever hear that word cisgender, that means that you accept the sexuality you were born with as your gender identity. I'd say most of us probably fall in that category. On the other side is transgender who are convinced that they are the opposite or different sex trapped in the wrong body. And public school sex education lessons are teaching kids as young as kindergarten that their sexuality is something they can choose from. There's many ways to express gender. They can choose whether they're male, female, neither, or both. But it's simply not true. Gender is a result of a sovereign creation, not a social construct. Now, I will agree that gender roles are a social construct. Absolutely. When we expect boys to play with trucks and girls to play with dolls, that's a social construct. There isn't anything in the Bible that says girls have to play with dolls. And every culture you go to, there are different expectations on males and females within that culture. Okay. You know, in some cultures, the females go out and work and support the family, and the men stay home and take care of the kids. That's a social construct. There isn't anything about gender in that. That's just a role that culture has responded. Okay, you want to talk about social construct, gender roles fit that category, but gender does not. The culture's dominant vision of gender identity, it offers no... It offers no stopping point. And you begin to see where the absurdity leads to. There are people today that are wearing pet collars, eat from a bowl on the floor, and identify as dogs. There are people who perform major body modifications to look dragon-like and identify as reptiles. There are grown men who identify as little girls. There are individuals who marry themselves. They call it Sologamy. That was a new one for me. Social construction is free to go anywhere our minds will take us. But then you run into problems. If a 35-year-old identifies as a 65-year-old, should the government be paying him Social Security benefits? If we identify, if, if, if I were to identify as a six-year-old girl, can I go enroll in a first grade? the local elementary school? If we identify as a particular minority, should I be able to receive a college scholarship that's been set aside for that particular minority because that's how I identify myself? If you answer no to any of those questions, then why is it that a male athlete who can't cut it in male athletics can identify as a female and all of a sudden be number one ranked in the country? 
And yes, that's happening with a swimmer in college today. Look it up. Absurdity. And yet it's being shoved down our throats as normal. And if you don't accept it, you're the one that's wrong. That's the corruption that is happening in our society. Here's the truth. God created mankind male and female. And the distinction between male and female does nothing to undermine the value or dignity of either. Whether you're male or female, you are created in the image of God. You are a soul for whom Christ died. That makes you valuable. That is your identity. And it's something that can only be assigned by the one who made you. A third lie that we often hear is that gay people are born that way. Same-sex attraction is innate. Sexual orientation cannot be changed. Although you can change your gender identity anytime you want. So we're told same-sex behavior is a legitimate, natural form of sexual expression. Well, what do you say to that? Well, not only does Scripture stand against it, but so does science. There is no compelling scientific study proving homosexuality is biologically determined. But there is evidence against that claim. They've done studies with identical twins. And if you know anything about the genetics of identical twins, they're identical. If you compare their DNA, you can't tell them apart. So if homosexuality is something that is genetically passed on, you would think that if one identical twin was homosexual, the other one would be too. But in extensive studies on identical twins, they have found that the occurrence of both identical twins being homosexual is 15% of the time. 85% argues against the idea that you're born that way. That's science, folks. Not just some radical, gay-bashing hater that the world wants to paint anybody that disagrees with them as. This is the truth. This is the facts. Even the American Psychological Association, which is very gay-affirming, has to admit, quote, Although much research has examined the possible genetic, hormonal, developmental, social, and cultural influences on sexual orientation, no findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factors. That's science. That's a group of science that wants to admit it, and they can't. <laughs> they are forced to admit that there is no scientific evidence to back their claim. And yet, you still get it in your schools, you hear it on the news, you hear it in the halls of our state houses and in Congress as they pass laws based on this, and there's absolutely no science behind it. So how do you explain this phenomenon? How do you explain people that identify as different gender, different age, different ethnicity? different species. The Bible says it's because of sin. It's the corruption of sin. That explains it. We've rejected the truth, so we've bought in the lies. And we not only practice these things, but we encourage those who practice them. Sin entered the world and corruption manifested by disease, disability, deterioration, and ultimately death came along with it. Now, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, and that's okay. But such conditions, these gender identity issues, are normally and rightly classified as, quote, medically identifiable deviations from the human binary sexual norm. Okay, say that in English. Here it is. Genuine 
gender dysphoria is best regarded as a psychological disorder. Oh, that sounds really harsh and hateful. That's not my idea. That comes out of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is the Bible of psychology. Now, the DSM-5 has bowed to political correctness, and they say that now only the distress caused by it can be diagnosed as a mental disease. But you go to DSM-4 and earlier, they classified it all. What it is, it's a psychological disorder. Folks, we're dealing with mental illness. That's what the science says. And the scripture shows us how that came about. When a man with a healthy arm decides his arm isn't a rightful part of the body and wants it surgically removed, does he have a body problem or a mind problem? When a man who is 52 identifies as a six-year-old girl, does he have a body problem or a mind problem? Does a woman who has anorexia and starves herself to death have a body problem or a mind problem? It's pretty clear. These are mind problems. These are mental issues. And when someone argues that they're transgender and therefore com contemplating irreversible gender reassignment surgery, we need to lovingly help them understand that they don't have a body problem, they got a mind problem, and it needs to be dealt with. Keep in mind that transgender surgery never changes anyone's sex. You can add on, you can take off any body parts you want. It doesn't change their gender because your gender is in every strand of DNA in your body. And you can't change that. Dr. Quentin Van Meter, who is a pediatric endocrinologist, says you are never changing the sex of a patient. Never. Every cell in the body is programmed to be male or female. That's why Dr. Paul McHugh labels transgender surgery of minors child abuse. Now, before you write these two off as radical conservative quacks, understand Dr. McHugh has spent more than 40 years as the Distinguished Service Professor of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University. 26 of those years he spent as a psychiatrist in chief at Johns Hopkins Hospital. He has authored six books and over 125 peer reviewed articles. And in the past 40 years, he has studied transgenderism and sex reassignment surgery. He's worked closely with many transgender individuals. He is an expert on the subject, and he's speaking out against it. And he's taken a lot of heat. You say, why? Why would he do that? In his own words, quote, I do so not only because truth matters, but also overlooked amid the hoopla stand many victims. Transgenderism is doing much damage to families, adolescents, and children, and should be confronted as an opinion without biological foundation wherever it emerges. Now, I guarantee you, you're not going to hear him on the NBC Nightly News. They're never going to ask for his opinion on this subject because he disagrees with them. In fact, both of these doctors are taking all kinds of heat because they're standing up for the truth in a culture that is driven by lies. They're not motivated by hatred. They are compelled by the care and concern for people who are hurting. And with this same truth and love approach, we need to help our own, especially our young people, successfully navigate this whole realm of gender identity. This leads us to the desperate state of sin. Let's turn to that passage that was read for us earlier in Romans 7. Romans 7. Paul is really being very vulnerable here. He, he, is, he is showing us a battle that he's facing. And you can hear it. You can hear it in the words. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I don't understand what I do. 
For what I do, what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, it is sin living in me. Understand, Paul's not making excuse here. He's not blaming something else. He's saying, it's sin in me. Evil is real. Sin exists. It's not just a state of mind. It's a reality. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who does it. It is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For my, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. He's speaking this as a Christian. People in the world couldn't care less about God's law, but he's saying, I delight in it. I want to do what's right. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who can rescue me from this body of death? Can you hear the desperation there? And that's the desperation we're hearing out there. Because the other thing you won't hear on the nightly news is that people that are going through these transgender sex assignment surgeries are not finding happiness. The suicide rate among the transgender community is four times that of the general population. Why? Because they're hurting and they're seeking for answers and the society has fed them a lie and it's not satisfying. Thankfully, that's not the last word because it concludes, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is hope. There is victory. There is a way out. And we have it. But all this passage describes the desperate state of sin. It portrays who I am by corruption, mastered by a sinful nature. Now, when it comes to this, this gender issue, I think sometimes it's a maturity issue. I don't think it's coincidental that three times more kids think they're transgender than adults. It's new, it's novel, it's cool, it's acceptable, it's being shoved down their throat, so yeah. And hopefully they'll grow out of it. That's why it's so wrong to do gender assignment surgeries on children because their brains haven't fully developed yet. I mean, the law will acknowledge that in a lot of other ways, but they want to let a 12-year-old decide for the rest of their lives and have a surgery that can't be reversed. Sometimes it's a mental issue. We've seen that as well. But you know, sometimes it's just flat out a moral issue. When we choose in spite of the facts of scripture and science that this is the way we're gonna go, that's a choice and it's a sin. And if there's not a mental disability that needs to be treated, if there's not a maturity issue that needs to be handled, it's a moral issue, and it's sin. Oliver O'Donovan expresses this very clearly. The sex into which we have been born is given to us to be welcomed as a gift from God. The task of psychological maturity, for it is a moral task, and not merely an event which may or may not transpire, involves accepting this gift and learning to love it, even though we may have to acknowledge that it doesn't come without problems. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong and do go wrong with every one of us, physiologically, psychologically, but the Bible offers absolutely no support that a man can be trapped in a woman's body or that a woman can be trapped in a man's body. That is simply not possible. It is a lie that our culture is passing off as truth. The soul is the soul of the body. The body is the body of the soul. You can't separate them, so you can't have the wrong one in the wrong place. 
Our culture says your psychology is your sexual identity. Let your body be conformed to it. The Bible says your body is your sexual identity. Let your mind be conformed to it. But either way, each person has a choice, and that makes it a moral issue. I want to conclude with a definitive statement on sin. I think every one of us can echo Paul's cry, what a wretch I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? When it comes to who I am by corruption, I am a sinner. But I want to tell you something right now, and this is so important. You are not defined by the sin you commit. You are not defined by the sin you have committed in your past. And that's precisely what the transgender agenda wants you to think. I am what I do. No, you're not. You are what you were created. That's your identity. You are a soul created in the image of Almighty God for whom Christ died. That's who you are. It is not defined by what you do. But we've got to be careful because we do the same thing. They call it identifying. We call it labeling. And we've got to be real careful that we don't label people. Oh, there goes an alcoholic. There goes a homosexual. There goes a drug addict. No, those are individuals. And maybe they're battling those various areas, but that does not define them. And even the people who are at the forefront ramming this down our throats are not the enemy. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the spiritual powers of darkness in the heavenly realms. This is something coming out of the pit of hell. And our battle is not against the people who are promoting the lies, but the spirits behind it that are pushing them. So what do we do? We don't hate the people that Satan has hostage. Pray for them. Pray for their release. Pray that they would see and accept the truth. Love them even as Christ loved you. In our sin, in our shame, in our guilt, love them. Yes, we must speak the truth, but we must speak the truth in love. Because if we beat them over the head with the truth, they will not accept it. If we think we're loving them by going along with their lies, that's not love. We must speak the truth in love. And if I had another half an hour, I'd go into detail on how to do that, but I can't, so figure it out. <laughs> but our motivation has to be love. But we must also stand for the truth. Culture talks of identifying oneself however one wishes. We don't have that right. Only our Creator does. And He has told us who we are. He has told us how valuable we are. This is how we find our identity. I want to conclude with a passage in Titus chapter 3. Because I can't emphasize enough how important it is the attitude with which we take this issue on. Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Remind the people to be subject to their rulers and authorities, to obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. To slander no one. To be peaceable and considerate and to show true humility toward all people. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us according to his own mercy. Let's continue to introduce this loving Savior to a hurting world. You know, Jesus was full of grace and truth. 
And he lived by both of those things. He's the model for how we engage on all issues. We must bring truth to bear by thinking carefully about the intellectual issues surrounding this whole matter. But we must bring grace to bear by engaging individuals with love, kindness, and hospitality. I know I've gone long. I appreciate your patience. This is not an easy message to preach. I'm sure it's not an easy message to hear. But I think it's important that we get the truth out.